Welcome to the Self and Society podcast, exploring what it means to flourish as an individual and a community. This is your host, Ari Armstrong, music by Jordan Smith, cjsclassical.com. Please join my email list for updates or help support the show financially at ariarmstrong.com. Our guest today is attorney and author, Timothy Sanifer. Welcome to the show, Tim. Thanks. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, this is our second show. We recorded also a show previously about your most recent book, The Ascent of Jacob Bronowski, about the science presenter. People can find that at my website, ariarmstrong.com. Sanifer is vice president for litigation at the Goldwater Institute in Arizona. He writes for publications, including the Objective Standard, and he is the author of several books. Today, we're going to focus on Sanifer's 2018 book, Frederick Douglass, Self-Made Man. And we're going to discuss this great American hero, Frederick Douglass. So let's start fairly broadly. Give us the elevator version of why Frederick Douglass is such an important 19th century American and one of America's great heroes. Well, I'll give you uh, the elevator version, maybe the, the longer elevator version too, because one of the theses of my book is that we tend to see him just in the elevator way, and we don't tend to see how profound and important he is as an intellectual. The elevator version is that Douglas is, uh, he was an escaped slave who became one of the nation's foremost advocates for the abolition of slavery, and probably the most important black intellectual until the 20th century. Uh, but the deeper version is that Douglas was much more than a, just a personal individual hero. He also was a very important uh, public intellectual and, I, and, and, and even a philosopher, a political philosopher. And that, we, we, that part of it tends to get forgotten when talking about Douglas because his personal story is so dramatic that people tend to just tell that part and they kind of leave out how important he was as a thinker. Well, unfortunately, some people leave out the entire thing. So yeah. <laughs> I hope that one thing I hope your book and other books do is try to inter is introduce the, the figure, the, the biography and the intellectual side of him. So hopefully this podcast will take one step toward in that direction. I want to set the context for slavery into which Frederick Douglass was born. Obviously, slavery does enormous physical harm to the victims. It steals their labor. But you also have some nice discussions in your book about the subtler or at least somewhat less obvious harms that slavery does, such as how it deprives a person of a family and of a personal history. So can you give us a sense of how slavery constitutes a total assault on the individual? Yeah, that's a very good way of putting it. And that actually was one of the most important things Douglas did as a thinker was to emphasize these aspects of slavery as opposed to just the obvious uh, brutality, physical brutality, and the, the compulsory labor aspect of it. Douglas emphasized in his memoirs, uh, which were first published in 1845, and then he published two other editions of it throughout his lifetime, that slavery had philosophical qualities to it. And what they constitute, what they build up to is the complete eradication of individualism and the, the replacement of the slave's mind or the attempts to replace the slave's mind with the will of the master. And so, the, it, so as Douglas emphasized, it wasn't just that, you know, the, the classic scene from the TV series Roots where, where Kunta Kinte is being beaten with a, a bullwhip. It wasn't just that sort of thing. It was also a, a pervasive psychological torture and manipulation by slave masters and, and their employees, which was designed to make a slave lose any idea of himself as an individual. That is, uh, it was designed to make him afraid of the master, obviously, but also to distrust his fellow slaves. To, to lack a, a concept of himself in, uh, in connection with others, a relation, family relationships, or personal history. And what I think is one of the most interesting aspects, interesting in a sort of diagnostic way, is Douglas emphasizes that slaves were also punished for doing their jobs too well. So it wasn't just that slaves are punished for, for failing to do a job. If a slave came up with a clever new way to solve a, a problem on the plantation, for example, the slave was just as liable to be punished for that because he was you know, getting arrogant and, and full of himself and had to be taken down a peg and that sort of thing. Douglas was born in 1818 in Maryland. In 1826, he went to live with Hugh and Sophia Ald in Baltimore. 
And you talk about how for a time Sophia taught Douglas to read, but that ended rather abruptly. So explain what happened with that and what lessons Douglas learned from that episode. So that's right. She was a uh, very young woman at the time. She had never owned a slave before, and she wasn't really sure how she was supposed to do this. And so she, uh, he, he asked her to, to teach him to read. And so she said yes, and she tried to teach him to read the Bible. And when her husband learned of this, he flew into a rage. It was dangerous and illegal to teach slaves to read. And her husband insisted that if, he, if you teach him to read, he's going to eventually want to run away. And Douglas later said that this was the first anti-slavery lecture he had ever had the privilege to hear. And of course, swore at that moment that he would do what it took to, to learn to read and write. And the way he did it, one of the, one of the ways he did it was to, to fool the neighborhood white children into teaching him the alphabet in a sort of a Tom Sawyer way of, of saying, well, I bet you don't, I bet you can't write the alphabet out. And the, the little boy would say, oh yes, I can, and would write it out. And then Douglas, of course, would, would learn from that. He would also study his, um, uh, uh, Sophia's son had, uh, you know, was, was in school and he would, he would sneak and study his homework. And, and then eventually he bought a book with some money he had saved called The Columbian Orator, which included some, um, anti-slavery writings in it. It was intended as a textbook to learn how to read and write eloquently and, and public speaking and things. And, uh, and it, it had cleverly been written to include anti-slavery pieces by an abolitionist editor who had hoped that this would influence the culture. And indeed it did, because Douglas got his hands on it and read the pieces about how slavery was evil. And this kind of helped to move him in the direction of, of anti-slavery thinking. I so mean, obviously he, he was, he was anti-slavery from the beginning, obviously having to suffer from it, but the idea that there were people out there who agreed with him and who shared his views meant a lot to him as a young man. So what other sorts of abolitionist ideas would have reached him in his childhood? Well, there's two really important ones. The, the first one was in 1831, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, a Massachusetts-based abolitionist, started publishing a newspaper called The Liberator. And Garrison was a radical Christian, uh, uh, and, and he was re really radical across the board. I mean, he was an early feminist, he was a pacifist, he was really kind of a, of a radical um, culturally as well as politically, um, and, a, and a great hero and a very eloquent man. But he had some views that Douglas would later come to reject, and, and we'll probably get into those in a little bit. The other thing was that in the 1830s, there was a controversy going on in Congress called the Petition Crisis. What happened was Congress had passed a rule prohibiting the receipt of any petitions against slavery in Congress. And at the time, there were virtually no anti-slavery members of Congress. In fact, there were really only two, and that was uh, Josiah Giddings from Ohio and John Quincy Adams, the former president of the United States who had been elected to Congress from Massachusetts. And John Quincy Adams made this prohibition on anti-slavery petitions kind of his personal crusade. He was in his late 70s, and for almost a decade, he would get up in Congress every petition day and try to introduce petitions against slavery. And the, the speaker would bang the gavel and call him out of order, and he would sit down and he would do it again and do it again and do it again. Uh, in, and his point was that the First Amendment guarantees your right to petition for a redress of grievances. And so he was trying to point out that slavery itself was bad enough, but slavery also required the prohibition of other kinds of freedom and would eventually interfere with other constitutional rights, including ones that, that white people cared about at the time. And so he would get up and put, introduce these, these anti-slavery petitions. Probably the most controversial one was when he tried to, in, he, he, he got up one day and he said, I'd like to ask if I'm allowed to introduce a petition purporting to come slaves. Well, the, the Southern congressmen were truly horrified by this idea and spent the entire day, rest of the day denouncing him in the most vituperative terms. Finally, when the, when the day was coming to an end, Adams got up and he said, look, I, I didn't introduce a petition. I only asked whether it was in order to introduce the petition. And by the way, I think this petition is a fake because it calls for me to be expelled from Congress. 
Well, the Southerners got even more irritated at that, and they spent, you know, and he just loved this. Adams just really enjoyed causing these kinds of controversy. Well, all of that was ending up in the newspapers at the time, and so Douglas was going to, to be reading those things in the Baltimore newspapers, as well as the things that William Lloyd Garrison was publishing, and that was what was developing his anti-slavery consciousness in the 1830s. So much of this might have been him reading or hearing the local reaction against the abolitionist sort of line of thinking. Is that, is that about how Very it? much so. Abolitionism was a time, especially because, you know, and, and when, we, when we say abolitionism, we should be precise about our terms. Abolitionism not, is not the, a synonym for anti-slavery. There have been different kinds of anti-slavery thinking in history. And um, until 1831, before then, was colonization, was the idea that we should abolish slavery and then ship the slaves and their children to some other country in Africa or Central America or something to live there instead of in America. And that was considered the, the polite way to be against slavery and included people like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison. And then in 1831, when Garrison came along, abolition came, was, was the, this new wave of radical anti-slavery thinking. And abolitionism meant immediate, not gradual emancipation, no compensation to slave owners for emancipation, and no colonization, no expulsion from the country. And that was a very radical idea. And eventually it, it won out. It became the leading anti-slavery way of thinking. But in the early 1830s, it was extremely controversial at the time. And so as a result, Garrison was nearly lynched in, in, in Northern cities. His uh, the uh, anti-slavery, uh, uh, buildings where you were going to give an anti-slavery speech. In Philadelphia, the, uh, the major anti-slavery building was burned to the ground. Douglas was, I mean, Garrison was paraded around with a noose, you know, in, in the streets and things. These extremely controversial ideas in the 1830s. In 1834, to get back to Douglas's direct biography, he was sent to live with Edward Covey, the so-called slave breaker. So what was this ordeal like and how did Douglas manage to endure it? Because this was obviously a pivotal time in, in his life. Yeah, it's, it's, this is probably the most famous incident in his life. He, re, he relates it in his first memoir uh, as kind of the turning point in his experience as a slave. Uh, Douglas had become, he was a teenager and you know, all teenagers talk back, but you can imagine what, what it was like to have Frederick Douglass around, especially because his owner, uh, um, was was starving to death, was refusing to feed him sufficiently. And Douglas was getting hungry and he was starting to steal food as a result. And he was getting more and more frustrated and angry at his situation. He'd been taken away from Baltimore and he was living in the countryside now. And it was, it was obviously an extremely difficult situation. And so in order to teach him a lesson, his owner said, well, I'm going to ship him off to this, this fellow named, named Edward Covey. And Co Covey had a reputation as a slave breaker. This was something he did to raise extra money on his farm in, uh, in rural Maryland. So Douglas goes to live with him. He's 17 years old. And what Covey does is spends a year basically torturing Douglas. Every week, at least, he would beat Douglas for some reason or another, even if there was no particular reason. And he would assign Douglas to do tasks that Douglas had no idea how to do and then punish him for failing at them and things like this. And then on one particular occasion when he, when Douglas uh, passed out from the heat, uh, uh, Covey beat him with a, a stick and Douglas managed to drag himself into the, into the forest and then decided to walk to his, two miles to town to beg his owner to rescue him. And Covey just let him go because he knew that he knew what was going to happen. So, of course, Douglas gets there and, and begs his owner for safety. And his owner says, no, it sends him back. And so uh, Douglas has to walk home. And when he walked back to Covey's farm, uh, he knew he was going to be punished again. And sure enough, Covey attacked him. And Douglas writes in his memoirs that this was the, the turning point in his life. He decided to fight back. And it was in fighting back, although he didn't, you know, he, he According to his story, he didn't uh, punch Kobe. I find that a little hard to believe. He claims that he fought Kobe for two hours and never hit him, but just fended off Kobe's blows. I find that a little hard to, to really credit. But in any case, uh, fighting for himself gave him a sense of self-esteem, just a, a small glimmer of respect that he was no longer allowing himself to be pushed down. And he used a line from uh, the poet Byron to describe this 
Marx, he said, who would be free must him. And this became Douglas's personal motto basically for the rest of his life. And he would tell this story to try and say, you have to believe yourself worthy of freedom and take a step in that direction. And even if you fail at it, it will make you just that much more free in some deeper sense that will then enable you to keep going the next time around. And that was, that was a very important lesson to Douglas. You mentioned Garrison and his religious radicalism. Can you say more about the relationship of Christianity, both with slavery and slavery ideology and anti-slavery and the abolitionist cause? Well, this was a very, uh, I keep saying controversial. I mean, obviously it was controversial since it led to the Civil War, but this was a, a very big deal at the time was how the churches dealt with the question of slavery. And both Garrison and Douglas were completely dissatisfied with the way that the churches dealt with this issue. In their view, the, the churches were either pro-slavery or were too cowardly. Even the Northern churches that purported to be anti-slavery to some minor degree, even they practiced racial discrimination. Really the only re religious organization that was out there really opposing slavery in a meaningful sense were the Quakers. And in much of the country, the Quakers were regarded as the radical fringe uh, that were not worth taking seriously. So uh, Garrison w refused to participate in what you would call the established the, 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 or organized Christianity. And Douglas uh, be had begun thinking he might actually become a preacher. In fact, he got a license as an AME preacher, but not very long after that, he, I believe, largely abandoned his faith. Now there's some controversy over this among the biographers. David Blight, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his biography of Douglas a couple years ago, he seems to believe that Douglas remained a devout Christian for the rest of his life. I strongly disagree with that. I think that there's no evidence that, that after say the 1840s, that Douglas religious in full sense of the word. Of course, he, you know, was deeply familiar with religious literature and he quoted the Bible all the time. But his close acquaintances of the time say that Douglas was really basically just a sort of a vaguely spiritual guy, but did not believe, certainly did not believe in miracles or anything of that sort. And um, and and he in fact was concerned about uh, Christianity's influence among the former slaves to manipulate them. So that, again, that's kind of a controversy among Douglas biographers, but Douglas was so uh, angry by the church's failure to take an anti-slavery stand in the 1840s that his, the second edition of his memoirs, uh, which is called My Bondage and My Freedom, which is much longer and more thorough than the smaller first edition, which is the one everybody reads, um, My Bondage and My Freedom just savages the American Christian churches for their complicity with or even outright endorsement of slavery. In 1839, Douglas finally escaped and he made his way to New Bedford, Massachusetts. I wanted to read something that he wrote about his early experiences there leading up to a question. He, he writes this, the fifth day after my arrival, I put on the clothes of a common laborer and went upon the wharves in search of work. On my way down Union Street, I saw a large pile of coal in front of the house of Reverend Ephraim Peabody, the Unitarian minister. I went to the kitchen door and asked the privilege of bringing in and putting away the coal. What will you charge, said the lady. I will leave that to you, madam. You may put it away, she said. I was not long in accomplishing, in accomplishing the job when the dear lady put into my hand two silver half dollars. To understand the emotion which swelled in my heart as I clasped the money, Realizing that I had no master who could take it from me, that it was mine, that my hands were my own and could earn more of the precious coin, one must have been, in some sense, himself a slave. So the question is, what was Douglas's general view of the relationship between productive work and liberty? Well, Douglas was a classical liberal, as we say. Uh, that is to say, uh, what, what is generally called a libertarian today. He believed in the principle of self-ownership as the basis of political uh, philosophy. And self-ownership means that you own your own body and your own mind, and then you own the fruits of your own labor, and you have the right to decide uh, the terms on which you're willing to trade that. 
and that was one of the one of the great evils of slavery of course was that it deprived the slaves of their right to self ownership to the fruits of their labor and so forth and so he writes in this passage which is probably my favorite passage of douglas's writing um he what he's writing about is the sense of liberation of of not like loosening from any kind of restraint so much as the self-command as the the feeling of being in possession and control of oneself that comes from self being being employed and from from earning one's own wages intriguingly there's actually a very similar passage in abraham lincoln's writings uh, where lincoln described in a letter i believe to a another uh, businessman how it felt when he earned the his first money you know lincoln grew up in terrible poverty and he, the the story that he tells is that he had a um, a raft and he was bringing he was he, he was asked to bring some people off a steamboat to the shore at at a river stop and when he was done the person got off the raft and tossed into the uh, tossed under the raft uh, two silver half dollars if i remember right and Lincoln has a very similar passage in his writing where he says, when I held this money and, and felt that sense of that I had earned it and it was mine and belonged to me, it was an overwhelming sensation to, to people like that. You can imagine what that was like. So Douglas is saying here that this, uh, this sense of self-mastery is a liberating experience and self-responsibility is a liberating experience. And that of course became a theme for the rest of his life. I mean, he was uh, constantly on the theme of, of uh, self-reliance and, and building up yourself as a responsible, productive person capable of, of and deserving of the right to run your own life and to, to earn your own bread. So an obvious follow-up, as you say, he often gave a speech titled Self-Made Men. Now, today, we often hear other things, other different lines of thought, such as you didn't build that. So what was Douglas's case that you can be self-made, and how, would he, how might he respond to modern critics of the idea? Well, there were critics even then. I mean, Douglas gave this speech, Self-Made Men, at least 50 times in his career. It became his most popular presentation. That's a way that Douglas basically paid his bills was he traveled the country as a traveling lecturer. And, and incidentally, you can get copies of his itinerary. They're published in his, in his memoir, or in, in the, the papers that are being published, the, the, the papers of Frederick Douglass. And it's incredible how much he traveled the country giving speeches um, for money. And his most popular presentation was this one. And he, it, what he does is he goes through the personal lives of certain famous inventors, engineers, and business owners who had started with basically nothing. And he, as he puts it, uh, if they have climbed high, they have built their own ladders. And even at the time, people said, well, these people weren't truly self-made. After all, you know, they had parents or they had teachers who helped them along the way and so forth. And of course, Douglas has a response to that in the speech. He said, obviously that's not, obviously that's true. Obviously there's no such thing as a genuinely self-created individual. But that's not what he was talking about. What he's talking about is people who had uh, not only the, the same advantages that are given to everybody, because everybody has the same kinds of assistance, but often far fewer advantages than other people, and nevertheless managed to, to prosper. There's an old, old story, I think it's uh, about ancient Rome, that uh, the famous wealthy uh, Senator Cato the Elder was walking through the streets of Rome and a beggar accosted him on the street and said, if you had not been born wealthy, you would have never become Cato the Elder. And Cato turned to him and said, yes, but if you had been born wealthy, you also would not have become Cato the Elder. And that's kind of the point I think that Douglas was making is that, yeah, of course, everybody does have some kind of assistance or whatever along the way, but some people managed to accomplish more than others and what are the virtues that have led them to to be able to do that and his his speech is then an analysis of those virtues and to turn around and say well you didn't build that is goes a lot farther than just you know pointing out some kind of a detail that the speaker may have forgotten or something what when a person says something along the lines of you didn't build that 
what they're really saying is you don't deserve credit for your own accomplishments or you don't really have any accomplishments because really you owe it to society or you owe it to other people that you've achieved something and therefore your life isn't really your own. Your earnings aren't really your own. Your property, your personality, your individuality aren't really justified and therefore you owe it to the collective in some sense or to other people or the tribe or the race or the state or whatever it might be to give up the things that you have labored for. And that's really, uh, that's, that's a, well, I was going to say it's a fallacy, but fa that implies that it's innocent. People who say these sorts of things, they're not doing that innocently. When they say something like, you didn't really build that, that's not an innocent error on their part. That's them trying to take credit for your achievement and to say that you should live for the sake of other people. And I think Douglas would have said that the idea that other people are entitled by right to the earnings of your labor on the theory that in some amorphous way you didn't really build that, those people are trying to reduce you to a position of servitude. So you mentioned the colonization plans from the 1800s. I thought we'd say a bit more of that, more, a bit more about that. Obviously efforts to send unwilling slaves, quote, back to Africa when many of them had never been to Africa in the first place, clearly manifest white racism. And yet, some black leaders also embraced colonization plans. So what were the plans and what became of them? Yeah, that is, that is exactly right. Um, for instance, one of Douglas's close collaborators, a guy named Martin Delaney, who uh, had co-edited a newspaper with Douglas early in his career and after whom Douglas named one of his sons, turned out to be an advocate of colonization uh, in this way, and this sort of this idea circulated for J Douglas's entire life. There were there uh, even as an old man in the 1890s, he still encountered a lot of Black Americans who said there is no hope for us in the United States. We should give this up and move to Africa or Central America or something like that. And Douglas was was constantly hostile to this idea. It betrayed one of the three principal elements of abolitionism, right? The, the three principal elements of ab abolitionism were immediate emancipation, no compensation to slave owners, and no colonization. And so Douglas saw this as a betrayal of what the abolition movement had struggled so hard for. And more deeply than that, he saw it as an embrace of white supremacy. If a black person were to say, well, this country doesn't belong to me because it's only for white people, Douglas would say, well, what's the difference between that and when a slave owner says, this country doesn't belong to you, this country was for, is only for white people. Douglas would, would absolutely never surrender the idea that America is a land for white and black people and that all Americans have the right to make their fates on this continent. Aside from everything else, it was just absurdly impractical to suggest that there was any way to take all of the black people out of the United States and send them to some other country. It would be so expensive to, to put that many people on ships and send them across the world that the, the government could not possibly have afforded it. And as a philosophical and moral matter, it was deeply wrong to abandon the new world to a white supremacist society, whatever one's motivation. And for that reason, Douglas denounced um, the the colonization efforts in eighteen in the eighteen nineties I think it was eighteen ninety three he gave a speech where he he made this point he said all of this native land ta talk is all nonsense the native land of the American Negro is America and I think Douglas really took seriously the idea that the the wealth and prosperity of the United States was largely a result of black labor. And therefore, they had a right to demand equal citizenship on equal terms with white Americans in this country. And it wasn't just white and black, by the way. Douglas was, an, in, was very emphatic about the right of immigrants to equal rights as well. Um, he gave some very passionate and beautifully written speeches about Chinese immigration, which was a big controversy at the time. And of course, he was a feminist in the sense of women having the right to vote and such. That's right. He was a delegate to the Seneca Falls Convention. And he literally died on his way to a, a women's suffrage meeting. But one footnote to the colonization point, there was actually some effort. There, there was some real efforts to move people 
back to Africa. So there's a, I didn't even know this till I read your book. There's a Monrovia um, in Africa, which is named after James Monroe. And so there were, there were some colonization efforts that took place, but that they were, what, what would you say? Those are relatively minor in the scope of things? Uh, well, they weren't very successful, certainly by the comparison to the number of slaves in the United States. I mean, you had 3 million slaves in the United States and, and only a tiny fraction ever immigrated to, to Africa. You had Liberia, which was established by the British. Uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, I'm sorry, Liberia was established by the United States uh, and, was, and the capital was named after, uh, after Monroe. And uh, to this day, actually, the leaders of, of Liberia have American names because the aristocracy there is largely the people who were descended from the original American colonists. Just it was Sierra quick, Leone that was established by the British. Okay. Just a quick follow-up on the abolitionist ideology. You mentioned that they didn't want compensation for the slave holders, which to us today seems, it seems obvious unless you needed to do that for some reason of political expediency. But today we're like, what about uh, payment to the slaves? I mean, where, where right. did that, I mean, to us, to us, that's the discussion even now. So right. did that, did, was it just too politically impossible to even bring up or was there a discussion about that but then it wasn't dominant or how did that work out? Yeah, there was some discussion, but it was it was politically impossible to achieve. I mean, nobody could afford it. There, there's you're talking about so much money here that it it would have been impossible to to do. And so there were some schemes. Uh, for example, in the 1790s, there was a lawsuit in Virginia called Pleasants versus Pleasants, which was over the validity of a will which uh, liberated some 200 slaves and the family refused to follow the will. And so another member of the family sued over this and the trial court ruled that the family owed, not only owed the slaves their freedom, but owed them back wages for the years that they had failed to free them. And that was such a colossal amount of money that the Virginia Supreme Court reversed that and said no. Uh, and when you come, multiply that by the number of people you're talking about in the United States as a whole, that, that'd be an immense amount of money. After the war, there were some ideas floating around about um, dividing up the plantation lands and giving those to the former slaves. And probably the, the most outspoken advocate of this was Charles Sumner, who was a, a radical abolitionist senator from Massachusetts, probably my favorite political figure in American history. Just such a, he's precisely the kind of person who's not supposed to exist in the United States, which is to say, a rigorously idealistic, ideological, principled, consistent man who was not only repeatedly elected to Congress, but attained the most powerful positions in Congress, chairman of the, of the Senate Foreign uh, Relations Committee, for example. Um, Sumner, however, was not a very practical man. And he would come up with these great ideas, but as, as far as actually implementing them, that was a little hard to do. And Sumner never really got very far with his, his uh, redistribution plan. And a lot of people opposed it. Now, there's kind of conflicting testimony on this also from the Douglas biographers. So a writer named Nicholas Bukala, who is a, a conservative admirer of Douglas, published a, a very good book called The Political Philosophy of Frederick Douglass, uh, in which he argues that Douglas eventually came to, to regret having not supported Sumner's redistribution plan. I don't think that's true. I don't think there's any real evidence of that. Uh, it, it looks to me like Douglas just said, you know, maybe that would have been a good idea, maybe not, who knows. In any case, Douglas would idea in the business of dividing up property and giving it to some people and taking away from other people. The last people in the world who should support something like that were the former slaves who were almost certainly going to lose out politically. They were a small hated minority. And the uh, if the government started taking away people's property, boy, they would be the first victims. So Douglas would have been strongly opposed to it just for that reason. Okay. But on theoretical grounds, I mean, if you're, if you're arguing that government should split up people's property on the basis of um, need or something, these people need it, that would be clearly, that would clearly lead to the sort of problems that Douglas seemed to have worried about but if your argument is more of a tort well yeah. these people these particular people 
severely mistreated this other group of people for a long time right. and extorted their labor. And so basically we're going to let the, the victims sue the perpetrators. And if they have to pay off their debts by selling off their land or distributing the land, that so be it. And so it seems to me from our modern perspective, there's no, I mean, arguably that there's a good theoretical basis for that kind of thing if done, you know, for actual damages. Right. Yeah, um, I agree with that. And, and I think, and I think if it had been put that way, I think Douglas probably wouldn't have disagreed with you on that point. I think he would have just said that as a practical matter, it's that kind of a dangerous road to go down because, um, because black Americans were, were in such a vulnerable position politically that it was best for them not to try and push that door open at that time. And now Douglas gave this very famous speech in 1865 called the, the history, of, it was a history of the anti-slavery movement. And it's very famous for this one paragraph where he said, um, he said, you know, we have been constantly asked, what shall we do with the Negro once he is freed? And my answer is do nothing with us, leave us alone. Your doing has caused all of the mischief with us. Untie our hands and be, and he says, uh, I, if the, he, says, he gives an, an analogy, he says, if the fruit is disposed to ripen too early and fall from the tree, I am not in favor of artificially wiring them onto the tree by any means. Uh, let the Negro stand on his own two feet, and if he falls, it will not be your fault, but the fault of he who created us. Well, Douglas got some heat for that because there were those who said, you know, the, we have been the victims of a colossal injustice and we're owed some kind of rep reparation. And so Douglas went on to say in a later speech, he said, you know, when I say leave us alone, I mean really leave us alone. What's going on in these Southern states is we're not being left alone. We're being terrorized by the Klan. We're having our rights taken away. We're not being allowed to vote, all these sorts of things. So we're not being left alone. And he says, by, by leave us alone, I mean treat us justly. And refusing to allow, he started talking about schools, refusing to allow us into the schools is not leaving us alone. That is not justice. And he, he said in that speech, if you were to build a new schoolhouse on every hill in the South, you would not come close to compensating us for the wrongs that have been done to us. And I don't think you could argue with that. That's absolutely right. So what exactly it meant to free the slaves was obviously, I mean, in these terms, was obviously an enormously complicated question, one that we're still dealing with well over a century later in its, in its implications. And what Douglas was trying to say, I think, was what we need is a solution that frees people as much as possible without creating a new form of dependency. And a good example of this was in occupied New Orleans at the end of the war, there was a general, General Butler, who issued an order saying, uh, I'm going to pre-approve all of the employment for the former slaves in order to protect them because they don't know what's best for them. They've never, you know, they've never been in the position of looking for jobs freely and, and negotiating wages and salaries and things. So they don't know what's best for them. So I am going to be in charge of setting the wages that the former slaves can accept. And when Douglas heard about this, he just exploded. He said, this is just reinstituting slavery. Telling us what jobs we can take and what wages we can earn is a new form of slavery. So I think you see there the tension that Douglas was dealing with and, and of course, you have things like, that he supported, like the Freedmen's Bureau, which was an effort to make it possible for black business owners to, to get loans for businesses, things like that. Those he supported. So it's a very complicated case where you're dealing with actual slaves who obviously had been the victims of terrible injustices. And in some sense, I, I often say Douglas was, was fortunate to die when he did, because he died in the 1890s before these controversies really started to divide the black community with people like W. Du Bois on one side and Booker T. Washington on the other. Well, it occurred, I was thinking about this and in the way that what he was dealing with anticipates even our modern reparations debates. And one of my thoughts was that people who think that wealth is fundamentally inherited or taken from the land will be might be much more, might care a lot more about reparations than people who think that wealth is fundamentally created, that you can start, you can go out in society with, with a dollar to your name and build a life for yourself, get a job, collect capital, invest, that kind of thing. So I wonder if that's just the basic, your basic orientation of where does wealth come from has something to do with 
where you think of the, how you think of these things in terms of their relative importance. Does that resonate with you? Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. And I, and I think Douglas being a classical liberal, he would have been more on the side, of course, uh, that, of the idea that wealth is created, but uh, he, he obviously had had pers great personal experience with those who thought wealth is, is, uh, is taken from other people. And I think he would have said that that's progress is moving from a society in which wealth is basically created by compulsory labor, taking wealth from other people and that sort of thing toward a, a society in which the individual is ever more free to be in control of his own life, to create his own wealth, to enjoy the fruits of his own labors. That's, that is moral progress. And I, I think he would have welcomed the idea of seeing that in historical terms of saying, well, we started out primitive and we're now growing to be a, a modern society with more greater technological advancement, greater social advancement that results from a more individualistic perspective. In 1854, you quote George Fitzhugh, who argued that slavery is the very best form of socialism. So explain something about the ideological shift between the early founding view, which was mainly that slavery was a temporary evil something to tolerate for now and let, let it phase out naturally or of its own accord. And then the later Southern view that slavery was virtuous and something worth positively uh, enforcing and maintaining. Yes, and this is really the, the epicenter of the, the controversies that are going on right now about things like the 1619 Project because the, the matchbook version of this story, the coloring book version of this story that we were given in something like the 1619 Project is, well, the founding fathers were evil they, because they owned slaves and they ignored slaves in the Declaration of Independence, and so there you go. And what actually happened is more complex than that. What you have is in the 17th century, you have the creation of, of what we call classical liberalism. And the, you have things like the English Civil War and eventually the American Revolution. And these are uh, wars and, and developments that are oriented around this new idea of individualism and, and self-reliance and autonomy and independence. And these are new concepts to people. And how, how broadly do they apply? Do they apply to all human beings? Do they only apply to Christians? Do they only only apply to Europeans. These are new questions. And then the American Revolution comes along and it looks to a lot of the crowned heads in Europe like their days are numbered. And they are. Uh, Thomas Paine certainly says so. So you have a reaction against that when the French Revolution breaks out. Of course, it panics all of the monarchies of Europe. And you have this move, this reaction against this liberal movement. It is basically what we, what we call, where we get the term reactionary is from the, the, the Holy Alliance, which is the, the group of monarchs who wanna keep the feudal order in Europe going. What, probably the leading intellectual that we still have with us today, who is a spokesman for this movement is Edmund Burke. And their idea is that society isn't about individuals who are basically free. Instead, society pre-exists the individual and decides what freedom to give to people. And it does so in terms of how they serve the social order. Well, these Burkean ideas, not necessarily Burke himself, but the ideas that he articulated become very popular in the United States among defenders of slavery who are afraid that their own sort of feudal social order is being threatened by liberalism and particularly by the liberal uh, movement that we now call capitalism. Pro-slavery thought then comes out of that. Pro-slavery thought is really the first form of anti-capitalist thinking in the world. And this has been ignored largely by uh, ideologically biased historians who prefer not to focus on this idea. And so they tend to play down the importance of figures like George Fitzhugh or John C. Calhoun or, uh, John, or, or Governor Hammond of South Carolina who wrote these books where if you actually read their texts, they, they're quite explicit about this. They're, they say slavery is good because it's anti-capitalist. They say the evil of capitalism is that it'll, it gives the individual autonomy and individuals can't be trusted with autonomy. First of all, they're, they're too stupid, and this particularly racial minorities or women, too stupid to know how to run their own lives. Also, it's dangerous and disruptive to society or it's antagonistic to Christianity. Fitzhugh is so unafraid of his analyst anti-ideology 
that he, when you read his stuff, you start to think that, that it's a parody. You can't believe that somebody would actually say the things that Fitzhugh said. And William Lloyd Garrison would often republish Fitzhugh's writings in his own newspaper to say, look at what these pro-slavery people think, right? So of course, in today's parlance, we, we, we say erased. Today, in today's scholars tend to erase George Fitzhugh from the record because it's, it's to, to admit that their own anti-capitalist uh, views are basically a hand-me-down from those anti-capitalist views is very embarrassing to them. So they downplay that fact. But that's, that's basically what's going on is in the 1830s, there's this new theory that slavery is actually a good thing. And that's a reaction against the founding fathers. And it's this new idea that we, is, it, we tend to call the positive good school. The positive good school of slavery that was an anti-founding fathers movement, and it's led by people like John C. Calhoun and George Fitzhugh, that's what Douglas and Garrison and others are reacting against. So it's actually a three-stage development. It's not like the founding fathers came along and they had slaves and they created the constitution and there you go. That's not how it goes. What it, the real way it goes is the founding fathers come along then in the 1830s, you have this new development. No, no, slavery is a good thing. Individualism is a bad idea. And then you have abolitionists saying, no, the founding fathers were right. Individual rights are a good idea. Slavery is bad and, and moves on toward the Civil War. So that's, what, that's one reason why the whole 1619 approach is so clumsy and stupid is because it ignores these important historical developments that you know, leave you with a bad uh, uh, perspective of how how this really happened. I want to ta address the Constitution question because you discuss how Frederick Douglass shifted from a William Lloyd Garrison position that the Constitution is pro-slavery document and should be rejected to his later views that the Constitution is fundamentally anti-slavery document and should be embraced and fulfilled, like made consistent. So was, the, was there his later arguments that the Constitution was Fun, in its fundamentals, anti-slavery. Is that the best legal analysis or is it as much as or more a matter of political strategy to couch it that way? No, that's a, that's the, that is the best way to ask that question. And it's really the question that hovers over this entire area today. Um, I, my own view is that the original constitution was studiously vague about slavery in such a way that the anti-slavery views that Douglas endorsed are plausible, but not definitively true. And that's why you had the war. That's why you, would have, you had to have the war in order to resolve that dispute. But I'll back up a little bit and explain. So in the 1830s, when Garrison comes along, he says, you know, the constitution is an evil document because it's pro-slavery. It, it created a, a, a deal with the devil, he says in that it compromised with slavery and that's wrong. And so what we need to do is the North needs to secede from the South over slavery and we need to abolish the United States and destroy the constitution and replace it with a new racially equal social order. Well, uh, Douglas was at that time a very young man. He had just escaped from slavery. I think, we, I think when we talk about this, you have to keep in mind how young Douglas really was. I mean, by the time Douglas escaped from slavery. He was 20 years old. He escaped from slavery, joins the abolitionist movement, and then abandons Garrison within just a few years. By 1845 or 1850, Douglas is already disagreeing with Garrison over the, over the Constitution. So he's a yeah, very young man. If you think about your own life and how you thought things when you were 30, and then by the time you were 40, you had, had second thoughts about it, you can kind of understand what's going on in Douglas's life. Uh, especially when you compress it, because Douglas had been in slavery uh, for the first two decades. In any case, so Garrison uh, is preaching this anti-Constitution theory, which Douglas at first endorses. But then with ju within just a few years, within, uh, by the time uh, uh, he returns from Europe in 1850, he had largely changed his mind. He moved to New York, and in New York, he, kind of, he fell in with the New York abolitionists who had a different view. The New York abolitionists were led by a guy named Jarrett Smith, a wealthy kind of odd man uh, who was, he ran for Congress and he was a wealthy landowner and a developer. And he was also kind of a nut. Uh, he subsidized and gave land to John Brown and he endorsed a couple of other movements that were kind of weird and things like that. But 
had his heart in the right place. And he, and he certainly had a great protege in Douglas. And he believed that the Constitution was an anti-slavery document. And he said to Douglas, well, you should read these books by people like Lysander Spooner, who had been mentioning these that slavery contradicts the Constitution. And their view was this, look, Constitution doesn't use the word slave or slavery anywhere in it. Now, that's pretty weird. If the Constitution protects slavery, you would expect it to use the word slavery. After all, it protects things like property. It protects things like an armed force or a post office, and it uses those terms, but it doesn't mention slavery. Instead, it refers to slaves as persons, right? And then it says, no person shall be deprived of liberty without due process of law. And it, it, then, then on top of that, there's this problem about what is a citizen of the United States? Amazingly enough, the 1787 Constitution never defines what the word citizen means. The word citizen was never defined in the Constitution until after the Civil War. So what about, say, a Black person who is born free in Massachusetts? Is that person a citizen of the United States? The way that that question was answered in that time was, if you were a citizen of a state, then you were a citizen of the United States. A black person could be a citizen of Massachusetts and therefore was a citizen of the United States. But a black person could not be a citizen of South Carolina and therefore could not be a citizen of the United States there. So what happens when it, if you get on a boat in Boston and you sail down to Charleston, South Carolina? Are you no longer a citizen of the United States? Except that the Constitution says, in another provision called the Privileges and Immunities Clause, it says no state can deprive you of the privileges or immunities of your federal citizenship. So if you're a citizen in one state and you travel to another, the other, that state has to respect your federal citizenship. So these caused all sorts of controversies in the years leading up to the Civil War, and it is one of the leading causes of the Civil War. Of course, that was the issue in Dred Scott, right? The Dred Scott case was, can a black free American sue in, Amer in federal courts? In Answer was no, because be a citizen of the United States. The Constitution does not say that. So these are some real controversies that are going on at the time. Now, in today's world, among law professors and judges and stuff, this anti-Constitution pro-slavery view is generally looked on as being silly, as being politically motivated, as not really being founded in the Constitution. And I think that's really unjust because, among other things, it was that view, it was Douglas's view that was embraced by the Republican Party that led to the Civil War and led to the ratification of the 14th Amendment. So when you read the 14th Amendment, basically what the 14th Amendment says is, the Frederick Douglass view of the Constitution is correct. That's basically what it says. So whatever you think about the Constitution of sla constitutional status of slavery before the Civil War, it is at least clear that the authors and ratifiers of the 14th Amendment intended to make the pro-constitution anti-slavery view, the law of the land. Okay. Now I want to get back to the Civil War and the 14th Amendment in a, in a bit, but I wanted to ask one more question about Douglas. So as you write, Douglas had pacifists such as William Lloyd Garrison on one side of him and insurrectionists such as John Brown on the other side. So Brown's 1959 uprising at Harper's Ferry actually resulted in Douglas fleeing to Canada and then to England to escape potential conspiracy charges. So how did he navigate between the Scylla of pacifism and the Shribdis of imprudent violence? Well, uh, he, he was very much not a pacifist. Douglas was never a pacifist. And when he escaped slavery and came and, and worked with Garrison in his early years in, in the North, this was always a little bit of a, of a discomfort between the two of them. And I suspect, by the way, I mentioned earlier that Douglas claims in his memoirs that when he fought with Kobe that he never punched him. I sort of think that's why he makes that claim is because he felt pressured to, do, to make that claim because of the pacifism thing. Uh, but after he broke with Garrison, he came right out and said, violence against slave owners is justified. And he, um, he very famously said that, uh, that the me best way to make fewer, uh, make fewer slave catchers is to make a few dead slave catchers. Uh, and he, he lionized John Brown. He thought John Brown was, was the, one of the greatest Americans who ever, who ever lived. Uh, now, as far as imprudence is concerned, that was his, that was his real concern there. He thought that, that things like the John Out Brown uprising were morally justified, but were very foolhardy. He thought they would, that would never succeed. Brown's plan of trying to 
to get the slaves in the South to rise up would never prevail. These people didn't have guns. They didn't really have easy access to it. They weren't even allowed to read, you know. And in fact, there's a story that uh, when uh, the preacher Henry Ward Beecher tried to raise money to send Bibles to the South, Douglas said, for God's sake, send them guns. So uh, Douglas was, yeah, he was definitely not a, a, a non-violence guy, except strategically. And so when the war came, he was, was really quite enthusiastic for the idea of using the military to liberate the slaves, um, but prudently, to do it in a way that would actually succeed. Doing it in a, in a foolhardy and rebellious way was not only not going to succeed, but was going to be counterproductive because every time there was a slave uprising, in the South, there were lynchings and further crackdowns on, on freedom and so forth. So that just, that wasn't going to succeed. Only the war offered the opportunity to put down slavery. Now, I want to say, in his book, David Blight, I think, very much exaggerates this point. And he says that Douglas was motivated by a desire for revenge against slave owners and I believe he uses the word bloodthirsty, that Douglas lusted for violence. And that is definitely not true. That is, in fact, the opposite of the truth. Douglas was willing to meet with his former slave masters when he was an old man. And that, that's not the kind of action that a person does if he's motivated by, by revenge. Douglas didn't want violence for violence's sake. And if the slaves could have been freed without violence, he absolutely would have wanted that. But he just, he knew that that wouldn't work and i'll just put in my personal dig he thought that violence should be used defensively or to for the purpose of getting free against the perpetrators not just against random people on the street <laughs> that's my dig for the president oh yeah context, of course but... absolutely yeah so, i mean douglas himself had been a victim of random violence on the street uh very often and so he, he knew better than, than that and he certainly knew better than just mob violence he, as an abolitionist order he was repeatedly subjected to violent, violent attacks on the um, on the stump when he was trying to speak against slavery in northern communities. On one occasion, his hand was broken by a, a enraged mob. Um, my probably my favorite uh, story on this subject is he gave a speech in uh, Boston supporting John Brown when an anti-John Brown mob came into the room and was heckling and screaming at him. And uh, when he tried to speak, they dragged him from the stage and pulled him out and threw him out the door into the street. And Douglas turned around and walked back into the building and climbed back up on the stage. <laughs> so Douglas was willing to put his life on the line for, for freedom and did so on many occasions. And for that alone, he's a great hero. So I wanna get a little bit more into the Civil War, but I wanna start with an anecdote. So in 1994, I went to Murray Rothbard's last summer conference with the Mises Institute in California. And I believe that was where I first heard this curious phrase, the war of Northern aggression. And of course, libertarian insiders are aware that the Mises Institute, I think it's unfortunate that it's named after Ludwig von Mises, who I really respect, has gotten into bed with some unfortunate and dangerous ideologies and ideologues so that's but that's just my current context and yet still that involves the debate with like thomas de lorenzo's book on lincoln so let me ask you what was the civil war about and why was that debated and then i guess why why is it still debated well i'm i'm grateful for the, for your setup actually i'm i've I've spent at least 20 years writing about uh, re denouncing the, the Mises Institute for their fraudulent scholarship, um, and in some cases, outright racism on the question of the Civil War. Um, it, it's a, a perennial embarrassment to the libertarian movement that the nonsense perpetuated by the Mises Institute on this subject uh, goes unquestioned uh, when it does. And I'm glad to say that I think we've seen a real turn against their their nonsensical perspective in the past several years. Well, for more on this subject, I would recommend that people check out my blog on, and particularly check out my article, How Libertarians Ought to Think About the U.S. Civil War, which I published in, in uh, Reason Papers about 20 years ago, um, which was the culmination of my lengthy debates with uh, Mises Institute 
influenced uh, writers. I will not call them scholars here because many of them are, are quite intellectually dishonest and particularly Dr. Woods. Um, the the C Civil War was, of, as with all wars, it was the culmination of many different forces. But uh, so it, you cannot accurately say that it was about any one particular thing. But the general overarching cause of the Civil War was, of course, slavery, as the South themselves said. Um, those states that declared their causes, only about four states that issued these, but they, they declared um, uh, their independence from the United States and, and declared the causes why, and they all cite slavery as the overwhelming cause. Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, said that the, per, the, the, the cornerstone of the Confederate government was the inequality of the black man and that his proper place was uh, enslavement. Now, what, what to, to be as charitable as I can be to the, to the Mises Institute side, their perspective is it would have been uh, a way to free the slaves that was peaceful. I mean, I, I, for the most part, I think the Mises Institute affiliated scholars are anti-slavery. Some of them, I think, say racist things that could lead you to, think, to question that. But for the most part, I think they're, they're authentically anti-slavery, but they just think that there should have been some way to free the slaves that was uh, peaceful. And they'll often point to, for instance, Russia or South America, where the serfs were liberated without war and so forth. The problem with that argument, the problem with trying to say that Lincoln was a warmonger because he failed to free the slaves peacefully, is that in fact, the only politician in 1860s America who sought to eliminate slavery peacefully was Abraham Lincoln. There was no other politician who sought to peacefully eliminate slavery. And, Doug, and Lincoln's plan was not to make war on the South. His plan was to end slavery in the Western territories so that they would enter the Union as, as free states, and then eventually you would, the free states would outnumber the slave states, and then you could get reform passed in Congress. That was his long-term plan for the eradication of slavery. And the only people who refused to allow that to happen were the Southern states who seceded from the Union, or purported to secede from the Union because of Lincoln's election, and initiated force in firing on Fort Sumter as a result of that. So there is no principled libertarian perspective that can possibly side with the South in the Civil War. As I explained in my article on um, how libertarians ought to think about the Civil War, the constitutional argument that states have a constitutional right to secede is false. There, there is no such thing. For one thing, there is no such thing as a right to secede uh, because the right to secede is a, a, a purported right of a state and states don't have rights. But that gets kind of technical, so I'll, I'll let readers read that for themselves. The Civil War was about slavery, and in particularly, it particularly, it was about the right to expand slavery into the West. That was the issue which the South could not compromise on. And when Lincoln was elected, the reason they seceded was not that they feared he would take their slaves away, because he wasn't going to. He had no plans to. He had no authority to do so, and and no as I said, no plans to do so. So it was just politically that would have been impractical anyway, which is one reason why the abolitionists didn't like Lincoln. <laughs> you know, when he was elected, Douglas didn't care for Lincoln for that reason. But Lincoln did say, we will not allow, that was something to abolish because they knew that eventually that would mean they were outnumbered in Congress. And so they started a war over that. I mean, obviously, we could get into the Civil War indefinitely, but uh, let's let's move past that. And you notice that in 1876, Rutherford, Rutherford B. Hayes took the presidency, basically in exchange for removing, promising to remove federal troops from the South. So briefly, what effect did that have on the South and on Douglas's psyche and thinking about his predicament? Yeah, well, briefly, it, it amounted to re-enslavement. Uh, what happened in the South in the eight, late 1870s was something very similar to what is going on right now in the Middle East, which is people got tired of the war. They saw no end in sight. They were, they finally came to the conclusion that there's no way to, that, that uh, our troops can keep those people from tyrannizing and, uh, and, and brutalizing their own population. 
capitulation, so let's just give up and go home. And that's what happened. Uh, nor the Northern troops were withdrawn from the South and um, over the course of the next quarter century, the Southern states slowly reinstituted slavery in all but name. So that by 1900, all of the black members of Congress who had been elected were, were out of office. You had uh, disenfranchised and 14, the 15th Amendment's uh, voting rights guarantee was increasingly ignored. The federal government did not bother to try enforcing those guarantees. Uh, because if it was a showdown and because they wanted um, uh, rapprochement between the uh, whites of the North and the South. And the cost of that reunion was to abandon the cause of black rights. So people like uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, what, they, what their program consisted of largely was reuniting the white people of the United States by disregarding the rights of the blacks and allowing the South to, to tyrannize over them again. And what, what you see in Douglas's career at that point then is increasing pessimism uh, a, a, and an emphasis on the importance of gun ownership. <laughs> Douglas keeps saying, you, you need to arm yourselves and, and we need the right to vote to be enforced to defend our rights. And what he sees unfortunately is um, very much the opposite going on in the country. It's a, really a tragic story in many ways. So I jotted down a couple of examples. You mentioned Teddy Roosevelt and Wilson. And in 1901, Roosevelt actually dined with Booker T. Washington at the White House. But then U.S. Senator from South Carolina, Benjamin Tillman, said, I'm going to quote, that the event will necess necessitate our killing a thousand inward in the South before they learn their place again. And to hear a sitting U.S. Senator say this is just shocking. Then a few years later in 1915, Woodrow Wilson screened the white supremacist film at the White House, Birth of a Nation, which today again to us is just shocking. And that was a half a century after the Civil War. So what can we, I mean, I guess we can observe there was a profound failure of moral reform during this period. Is there anything we can say as to why? Because it's just 50 years? You can't get your act together in 50 years. Come on. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Well, it is, it is a tragic and horrible thing. And by the way, this, I think, is the aspect of history that I think a lot of white Americans are not familiar with. I think, you know, there's, I think a lot of people read about Frederick Douglass in their history books in high school, and that, that's, you know, and, and they don't read his philosophy. They just read his, his personal story, and that's basically it. And that's what they know. Um, and then the history tends to then skip over to, you know, it goes like, like uh, 1861, Civil War breaks out, 1865, Civil War ends, the next chapter is 1963, you know, uh, and it, you tend to skip over the period that historians call the nadir of, uh, of black rights in, in the United States, and that is at the beginning of the 20th century, which is really the worst period of, um, of time as far as black freedom is concerned in the country. And uh, ben Pitchfork Tillman, who this was not the only occasion on which he endorsed lynching. Uh, Pitchfork Tillman was a, an outspoken advocate of lynching as an, a necessary element of the Southern way of life. Um, there's a statue, or until recently anyway, I don't know if they've taken it down yet, but there's a statue of him on the Capitol grounds in, uh, in South Carolina. And incidentally, this is an interesting tidbit, uh, Tillman was the leading, was the foremost advocate of campaign finance reform in the United States. He advocated restrictions on campaign financing because Northern corporations were coming to the South and, you, and donating money to political campaigns and disrupting the Southern way of life. So what we need to do is ban corporations from donating to political campaigns for that reason. Uh, anyway, so you, you have increasing belligerency on the part of the South at this time and an, a decreasing willingness to care or do anything about it in the North. And it becomes this sort of uh, perpetual motion machine, a, a downward spiral really. And at the same time, of course, you have among whites, you have a rise philosophically of doctrines like eugenics or the, the historicism of George Hegel, uh, the German philosophical influences that start to come into the country around the 1900s, 1890s and so forth. 
that um, are, again, very anti-individualist. So there's a very interesting book um, published in 1903 on the history of American political philosophy by a guy named Charles Edward Miriam, the first political philosophy professor at the University of Chicago. And in his book, he says in 1903, our country has basically embraced the ideas of John C. Calhoun. And he says, from the modern perspective, the pro-slavery forces were correct that Southern blacks were incapable of exercising freedom responsibly. And although he stopped short of actually endorsing slavery, he is, to all intents and purposes, he's saying that the, the country has become, philosophically speaking, pro-slavery and has abandoned the classical liberal perspective of the Declaration of Independence. And historically speaking, he's right. That, that is indeed what had happened by 1900. At the same time, uh, the historians, particularly at Columbia University in New York, had created what is now known as the Lost Cause School of History, which is the theory that the South uh, had, had noble intentions in the Civil War and that it had been um, wrongly persecuted. Now, this is not really, not technically a pro-slavery argument because they don't quite endorse, even Woodrow Wilson didn't quite endorse slavery, but they, they come so close to it that it's practically the same thing. Their argument is that the, you know, the Southern way of life had been terribly disrupted by the reconstruction experience. Uh, blacks couldn't be trusted with freedom. Individualism is a bad thing uh, and so forth and so on. This is history that has been underdeveloped by the American history profession. It's a, a real shame and it's politically motivated that the philosophical connection between the pro-slavery argument of people like George Fitzhugh and the progressive arguments of people like Woodrow Wilson or Oliver Wendell Holmes and others, that connection is a very strong one and it has been ignored by intellectual historians in this country. I think it's starting to turn, but it, a lot of work still remains to be done. Okay. Well, I do think it's worth us pausing for just a moment and acknowledging that Black Americans endured decades of horrific terrorism by white mobs, white racists, Ku Klux Klan, et cetera. And it was just horrific torture and mass murder for long periods of time. And it's... it's, it's You're it's, talking it's, about a time, like in 1906, if I remember right, I don't know, off the top of my head, 1906, there was a lynching every other day in the South. So it's, it, it, it boggles the mind today to think about how horrific this is. And if you want to put an optimistic spin on it, it's incredible how much progress has been achieved since those days. And that at least is, you know, that's a, a positive way of looking at it. But this is, this is history that, that people really need to know, white as well as black. And they need to see that these stories are stories of achievement, of individual achievement in light of the principles of the American dream. And that the the, the revulsion that we feel at that history is a testament to the rightness of the principles articulated in the Declaration of Independence that all people have the right to be free uh, of this kind of tyranny and that that fight is a perpetual one. Okay. In your book, you give several people honorary mentions, including Booker T. Washington, Ida B. Wells, Du Bois, uh, Thurgood Marshall, and then even Martin Luther King, the 20th century figure. And here's, I'm just going to quote a quick line from your book. The decay of the nation's commitment to civil rights, this is after the Civil War, motivated Washington's conciliatory tone and drove Du Bois to greater radicalism. So obviously you can't do justice to Frederick Douglass's full influence on black leaders up to the modern times. Are there some main lines you can, you can outline or summarize? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier that, that Douglas was in, in one sense fortunate to die when he did so that he didn't get caught up in these incredibly complicated debates that occurred between Du Bois and, uh, and Washington. Well, that's a bit of an exaggeration because Washington didn't really debate Du Bois. It was Washington's supporters who debated Du Bois. But um, so, so what happens is Washington is born in slavery, knew Frederick Douglass personally, wrote one of the very first biographies of Frederick Douglass. 
And Washington takes the perspective that what Black Americans need to do is to develop sort of a, uh, a financial and industrial foundation so that they can then afford to take the steps necessary to defend their civil rights. And not just afford it in a financial sense, but also in a moral and spiritual sense, because we need to develop this sense of self-reliance and, and, um, and, and pride in ourselves at what we've achieved. That's, that's Washington's self-reliance school headquartered at, at the Tuskegee Institute. On the other hand, you have Du Bois. Now Du Bois is the first Harvard PhD graduate who's black. He's highly educated intellectual, very philosophically, writes beautifully. His view is that, no, what we need to do is develop what he calls a talented 10th, which is develop an intellectual leadership and take political uh, moves to establish Black equality first. We need an intellectual vanguard for uh, a, a, a transformation of American society. Now, you notice when I use terms like vanguard and things, there's a, a Marxist element to that. Du Bois was, ended up joining the Communist Party, giving up his American citizenship, endorsing Joseph Stalin. So Du Bois is a far left radical. That's not to say that he was necessarily wrong in everything he said. In fact, if you read The Souls of Black Folk, his most famous book, it, it's highly persuasive that what, what we need is an intellectual leadership to defend our civil rights. On the other hand, Washington, I think, has been unfairly maligned. He gave this very famous speech in the 1890s where he said uh, he seemed to endorse segregation by saying that we can be as united as the hand, even as we are as separate as the fingers. And that seems to, to be a, a sort of surrender to segregation. Well, that's not really all that fair because, in fact, Washington worked hard against segregation, funded lawsuits to challenge the constitutionality of segregation, funded them, funded them secretly, um, and certainly was not a, a segregationist himself. Also, he was in a position where political activism wasn't going to do any good. Political activism was going to get you murdered. It, it wasn't going to accomplish anything in his day. Uh, so he was trying as best he could to, to survive in an atmosphere that was truly stifling. So this debate between Du Bois and Washington is, is a complicated one. Both sides have very good points. I think it's the most interesting political debate of the 20th century. And yet um, it, it tends to get shortchanged in our history books because largely the, the perspective nowadays is, well, Du Bois was obviously right and Washington was obviously just a, a surrendering to segregation. In fact, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, Netflix has this new TV series, miniseries on the life of Madam C.J. Walker uh, who was a famous black entrepreneur? Marvelous show, just great. I, we we watched it the other day, and I just loved it. Except there's this section there; it's it's mandatory. There's a section where they have to to be snide about Booker T. Washington. Well, he's just you know he's surrendering to segregation, which is really not fair. I would I would urge people to to check out um, a, a marvelous book by a guy named Norrell, Richard Norrell, called Up from Up from History which is a biography of Washington that really rescue, rescues him from some of the misrepresentations that, that we've been hearing in the past several years. So Douglas's influence is, on one hand, Douglas very much was a pro-self-reliance guy. He even spoke at Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee uh, and on the subject of self-made men. But on the other hand, he was also very much a political activist. And he would, I think, have endorsed Du Bois on the question of political activism. So I, I think both sides can real, really appeal to Frederick Douglass, kind of in the way that Republicans and Democrats kind of both appeal to Thomas Jefferson. Well, we could go on for hours on various topics and subtopics, but I think I maybe ought to approach the end here. But I wanted to ask you a contemporary question. To me, the perfect actor to portray Frederick Douglass in our day would have probably been Chadwick Boseman. Unfortunately, that can't be because he died of cancer not long ago. Um, even though we rewatched the the great film Forty Two about Jackie Robinson the other night, and that's that's fantastic. Have you heard any chatter about turning Douglas's story into a major film? Because it it seems like that could be one of the great American films about one of the great American figures if done well. You hear stories every now and then. I actually was consulted by a, a, some people who are working on a script a while back, um, but I think that I think with the the pandemic and things that, that probably fell through. I haven't heard anything. 
there was talk a while back uh, about this mini series that uh, bo- that um, Barack Obama is is supporting for Netflix that was going to do an episode about Douglas, but I, I didn't hear much more than that. Douglas, to my knowledge, has been portrayed in on film a total of three times. One of them is in a very brief cameo in the movie Glory, which is a great movie, very very highly recommended. Um, another is John Legend played him in an episode of. Um, uh, underground, which was a, a short-lived television series about the Underground Railroad. And then in the more recent movie um, about Harriet Tubman, there's a, a scene w- which I must say is rather unfair to Douglas. It, it, it sort of tries to characterize Douglas as being something of a, of a comfortable bourgeois uh, conservative who doesn't care about protecting, you know, taking militant action. That, that's deeply unfair to Douglas, who was very much a militant. There's also, I think, a brand new movie that's coming out, which is oddly enough a comedy uh, in which Douglas is a character, but I don't know much more than that. Uh, and it's a shame. I, I, as far as who should play Douglas, personally, as a fan of the Ken Burns miniseries about the Civil War, I always hear Morgan Freeman's voice in my head when I read Douglas. One of the things I love about the way Friedman does Douglas's lines in the Ken Burns miniseries is he's so calm. When you read Douglas's writings, Douglas is just a gorgeous writer. He writes in this beautiful, impassioned Victorian era prose that I just love. And it sounds like it should be thundering and pounding on the pulpit. But when, Martin, when Morgan Freeman reads it really quietly, somehow or another that makes it even stronger. So I, I would love to see Morgan Freeman play an old friend of reflecting on his youth and everything. But as far as a young actor, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I hadn't thought of that. Okay. Well, let's close with a personal note. Explain what it is you do at the Goldwater Institute in Arizona and talk about how your historical research, so you've done now two, two books on historical figures, folds in with your other projects and then uh, let people know how to follow your work. Well, I'm the vice president for litigation at the Institute, which means that I oversee our legal team, which is charged with uh, suing the government for violating the constitution and things. Um, it's a great work. I, it's the, the most fun job that there is. But as far as how um, the history connects with it, you know, law is very deeply about history. And you have to really know the history in order to understand the legal and political controversies that persist through the generations. To understand the Constitution, the 14th Amendment, things like that, you really need to know about the the crises like the Civil War that gave rise to these laws and to these constitutional amendments. So that's a a very important part of it. And understand, I mean, you could go through all of law school and never know that there were people who thought that slavery was unconstitutional even before the Civil War. It's just not taught. And so knowing that history is personally rewarding as well as being helpful for legal analysis. Uh, and as far as now, some of my other writing, I, I don't, I can't pretend that they can, like the, the Jacob Bronowski book that you and I talked about a while back, that, that has no connection whatsoever to my legal work. I just did it because I think he's an interesting guy and I wanted to do it. But, um, but that's why Douglas is so important and, and, and a really underappreciated American intellectual figure as well as biographical. Uh, people can find out, find my work at, uh, at my blog, which is sandifer.typepad.com. And the, uh, the Goldwater Institute's blog is indefensiveliberty.blog. Uh, and our main website, you can just Google the Goldwater Institute, find out the kind of work that we do. Okay. Well, I'm going to give Frederick Douglass the last word here. So I'm just going to read a little selection from, I guess, his final speech or last major speech of 1894. Here's what he says. Part of what he says. I would call to mind the sublime and glorious truths with which at its birth, the United States saluted a listening world. It announced the advent of a nation based upon human brotherhood and the self-evident truths of liberty and equality. Its mission was a redemption of the world from the bondage of ages. Apply these sublime and glorious truths to the situation now before you. Put away your race prejudice. Banish the idea that one class must rule over another. Recognize the fact that the rights of the humblest citizen are as worthy of protection as are those of the highest, and your problem will be solved. 
your republic will stand and flourish forever. Our guest today has been Timothy Sandifer, author of Frederick Douglass' Self-Made Man. Thanks for being on the show today, Timothy. Thanks, anytime. Uh, for more, please see ariarmstrong.com.